much for tuning in to another episode of The Dancing Professor. On today's lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of the origins of human factors, uh, specifically emphasizing the machines of war in World War II. We're going to begin by talking about the evolution of engineering psychology. We're going to talk about the specific concepts and definitions that go into this particular field. And we're also going to learn about selection and training of the system's operators. Then we're going to continue talking about human engineering and how it really brought into light the differences between human error versus design errors, as well as the importance, important emergence excuse me, of psychoacoustics. Lastly, we're going to wrap up the lecture with applications of all of the above in the real world, specifically in the aviation, military, and lastly in academia. So what is engineering psychology? Well, engineering psychology is defined as the science of human behavior in the operation of systems. Engineering psychologists are mainly concerned with the effects of performance of system operators. So operators are the, one, are the humans that actually operate the different types of machinery. So, of course, this includes understanding the hardware, the software, as well as the liveware. Um, engineering psychology is involved in the study and application of design principles for this type of equipment, as well as the importance of understanding the training procedure that goes into telling these human operators how to use the particular design. Um, so the main goal, essentially, of, of engineering psychologists is to optimize the ergonomics of a system to maximize operator performance, essentially meaning how, how can engineering psychologists help the operator, the human, do his or her job the best and to train people to get the best performance within a machine's limitations. So we know that machines are not perfect, but with the appropriate training and the appropriate knowledge, uh, those operators will be able to successfully use the machines uh, even though they do have their limitations. So this is an example of something that an engineering psychologist would be looking at. So on the top left, we have the workspace or equipment, right? So this relates to the ergonomics, to the environment, right? The different displays that the soldier would have to look at, the different interfaces, um, what's happening around him, you know, is it rocky, is it muddy, are they indoors, are they outdoors? The load carriage, right? We know that the soldiers have to carry a lot of load on them because they carry their ammunition, they have their uh, gear, all of these things. Um, in, on the right corner, we have the physical stature and signal processing. So this is anthropometrics, right? This is all related to um, the physiology, uh, I'm sorry, the signal detection, the perception of senses, um, psychological presence, right? Cognitive load, all of those things that we talked about in terms of being aware of your situation, understanding the next step, what to do, understanding what's happening around you. Trust and automation is a really big one, right? Um, of course, with so, so much technology and so much machinery, and especially if you're a soldier on the battlefield, you understand that you have to put your trust into the devices that you're using, right? Because it's a matter of life or death. Um, health hazards, right? Vibration, biomechanics, noise, toxic things flying around in the environment near you, all of these things, and as well as the physiologic status of the particular person, right? So you have autonomic activation, you can get tired, you might get hungry, you might be dehydrated, are you physically fit to be doing this job, are you de deprived of sleep? So all of these things are just examples to give you an idea of what an engineering psychologist would be focusing on. So um, it seems like, you know, for a soldier this is a lot of things that goes into his or her job, but actually you can apply all of these things to any particular job and any particular work setting. And so that was what engineering psychologists uh, focused on. They also focused on the distribution of system functions in a machine among people, right? And these people we're going to be calling operators from this point forward. So basically, what is the human responsible for when operating a given piece of machinery? So it was very common for human, uh, sorry, for engineering psychologists to work backwards from a particular goal or destination um, to actually determine the needs and the conditions that need to be satisfied in order for the task to be completed efficiently. So sort of knowing what the task is and how to get there um, was determined first and then the, the necessary steps that the operator would have to complete to actually reach their final destination was determined. Um, so once the functions are identified, engineering psychologists try to determine if there's an optimal way to execute those functions, right? So um, this, this just means that there may be more than one way to actually complete a particular task, but the optimal way, again, is the one that will result in higher efficiency and the lowest amount of effort exerted. 
and probably the, the shortest amount of time. And again, because we're talking about World War II, again, uh, timing is essential in the war because you just have seconds, you know, to protect yourself and to protect others. So this brings us to the discussion of automation versus human action, right? So uh, functions are identified based on theories on empirical testing and simulation. So how do we know which tasks should be automated? How do we know when it's time to take responsibility away from the operator or the human and actually put that responsibility uh, embedded and programmed into the machine? So um, I'm really curious to know what you guys think about this. Um, do you feel like automation is good? Do you feel like automation is bad? Is it a balance of the two? So um, today we know that automation is very used, particularly in, in aircraft, particularly in the war, and in a lot of other things. But there have been studies that indicated that too much automation is not always a good thing. So automation is helpful, but should be used cautiously. It can be used to assist these operators by enhancing sensation and perception of surrounding stimuli, right? So it, it's helpful in understanding what's going on around you, right? If there are enemy aircraft near you, um, if you have any sort of, you know, other particular obstacles coming at you. So automation is great if like a radar can detect it for you because your, you, your attention might be directed elsewhere. Um, it also speeds up processing and reduces the order of control. So um, oftentimes, when we're doing a particular task, uh, again, our cognitive resources are limited. So while we're focusing on doing one thing, if the machine can actually take control and automatically enforce another action, that also helps us. And the same thing, you know, was applied to soldiers on the battlefield. Um, automation protects operators from making rash decisions during highly stressful or emotional situations. Um, we know that we tend to lack an ability to think rationally or logically. Um, if we're, you know, panicking, uh, if we're in, you know, some extremely aroused state. So automation helps with that. Automation can also decrease an operator's workload um, to the point of boredom. So in this particular study that I was talking about, um, what was happening was that autopilot was activated in a particular flight. And when something went wrong with the autopilot, uh, the actual human pilot, right, the operator, was not aware that something had happened and just placed full trust into the autopilot. And so that resulted, it, it didn't result in a complete accident, but in a near accident. So what happens is that this becomes problem problematic when automation fails, but the operator is not prepared to take action. Because their workload has been so much reduced, they almost get bored, right? They have nothing to do, so they become lethargic, they be become fatigued, and they're not as quick to have reflexes or reactions um, when it's time to take action. So should people monitor machines or should machines actually monitor people is sort of the, the never ending question. Um, so now we're gonna talk about selection and training of system operators. Well, as we mentioned earlier, machines have limitations of course and operators who are operating them actually need to know how to effectively maintain control of them while working around these limitations. So the success of an operator statistically and according to research has generally been based on intelligence and psychomotor abilities. So several instances have indicated that this actually is not um, sufficient. So this means that perhaps they were given an IQ test or they were able to pass all of their exams to actually get this operator position. Um, they had no physical disabilities so their motor movement was not impaired in any way and the psychomotor ability where the brain is actually connected to your muscles, the brain sends signals you know, to your particular body parts to actually uh, execute functions, um, those were all in check, but uh, sometimes that is not enough to actually be a successful operator. So what actually needs to happen is cognitive flexibility. Um, operators need to be able to make rapid adjustments in attention to actually handle emergencies. So again, in terms of training, um, you know, flight simulators are used a lot to simulate emergencies, but when it actually happens in reality, will the pilot or will the operator be able to actually maintain control of the machine? So again, we talked about these emotional factors that come into play. We talked about um, workload. When, a, when an operator is overloaded with a variety of things, are they actually able to improvise and think on the spot and spontaneously remedy a particular emergency situation? So cognitive flexibility essentially is that it's the ability for a person to shift their attention from one thing to another um, successfully and in a short amount of time. 
So a greater burden is placed on training when the operator selection criteria are vague and when a machine becomes more difficult to operate. So we see this a lot with the advancement of new technology. When a new form of technology is released, um, not enough people have used it to actually you know, tell you how to use it or explain to you. So it sort of is what it is once it's released. And again, if you recall from our first lecture, during the time of the war, uh, changes were being made to aircraft sort of on a daily basis but there was not enough time to actually test them. And so um, that's when the criteria for the operator would become big, right? And if nobody really has any experience operating the particular machine, it will then be difficult to create a proper and appropriate training mechanism for that operator. So modern training technology is dominated by computer-based teaching. In the late 1940s, operators have the ability to train in synthetic environments with synthetic devices, synthetic meaning uh, like laboratory created so they're not actually in the real world interacting with this and um, these devices were able to measure and improve the operator performance. So today we have modern day airplane simulators as a perfect example for these synthetic devices. With the assistance of engineering psychologists operators were actually able to learn transfer of training and apply their knowledge from one system to others. So transfer of training uh, basically just means that whatever system you were trained in, you're able to apply those concepts and those principles to another system. So for example, if you had an iPhone the whole entire time, right, but it was touch screen, and then suddenly you get an Android, it doesn't mean that you have to completely relearn how to use a touch screen Android, right? There are still certain, there, naturally there will be things that are different in the Android device, but um, a lot of things are similar between what you know about using an iPhone that can be transferred to using an, an Android. So um, hence was born operational management and this focused on the selection and training of operators for programs or systems beyond airplanes. So again, because we're talking about World War II and because we remember from our first lecture that human factors really originated during the time of the war, um, people were actually able to understand that all of this training can actually be applied to other systems, not only aircraft. So um, that covers our topic of engineering psychology. Now we're going to move on to the topic of human engineering. So the earliest experiments on human factors design were made during World War II in Cambridge University, which is actually in England. Um, Sir Frederick Bartlett, if you remember from our previous lecture, began work on the first uh, airplane simulator. And more specifically, um, the whole reason that he decided to create a simulator was because he was noticing the various problems in the design of aviation equipment. So yes, again, he was known for establishing the first airplane simulator, along with uh, gentlemen Craig, Vince, and Hick, who actually studied manual control performance, including the direction of motion between controls and displays. So basically, how machines move in a controlled manner. Um, again, at that time, uh, aircraft and cockpits and gauges and all of those things were created without the proper testing. So there were certain ways that the controls were moving that perhaps were not as user-friendly as they could be and as intuitive to the operator um, controlling that machine. Then in 1939, the Council Committee on Aviation Psychology was founded. And this really focused research on the psychophysiological tension of operators. So again, we understand that the physiological uh, factors could be um, you know, shaking, it could be sweating, it could be those um, toxic things that appear in our environment that have an effect on our health, it could be fatigue, it could be dehydration. So those are the physiological things. The psychophysiological tension is how those physical things actually affect the way that the operators were thinking and perceiving and actually operating, um, you know, in this higher level processing. So there is, of course, a relationship between the way your body physically feels and your ability to think and to make decisions. So that was actually the first time that research like that was conducted. And the first airborne polygraph actually measured pilot performance. So this polygraph determined that muscle tension can affect pilot performance. And uh, specifically, when they were conducting this research, they noticed that um, pilots make very particular eye movements uh, during flights, especially when they were uh, making approaches or landing. So based on the location of where the pilot's eyes were falling, they created the, the six uh, gauge screen that now we see in modern day airplanes. So uh, that's a fun fact. So next time you are actually in an airplane, why don't you check it out and see that this is actually the standard way 
that cockpits are designed with their uh, main six gauges. So in 1940, John Flanagan actually set up the first aviation psychology program for the U.S. Army. Once America entered the war, the program expanded, and today it's known as the U.S. Army Air Force's Aviation Psychology Program. The earliest documented instance when psychological principles were used to explain an operator's failure was during the war in 1943. So essentially, um, this program was founded, right? People were learning about all of these psychological factors, learning about psychological theories, and so the first time that we actually saw it applied in action was during the war. And of course, you remember the classic case of the B-52 pilots, where they confused the landing gear with the steering flaps because the two controls um, looked identical to each other and they were placed very close to each other. And so again, during times of combat, they would pull the wrong lever and activate the wrong function. So the term pilot error started appearing when discussing training or combat accidents. And so, you know, researchers were like, okay, wait a minute. How much of this is actually the operator's fault, the pilot's fault, and how much of it is it because the design was not intuitive? So at what point does human error become attributable to flawed design? So this brings us to the idea of human error versus design error. And, you know, the difference uh, between these two is not very clear. It's pretty difficult to parse through the difference. But in the case of the B-52, the P-47, and the B-17 aircrafts, the levers for the flaps in the landing gear were identical and they were located side by side. However, the problem did not occur in the C-47 aircraft because the controls were very far from each other and distinctively different. So again, if you think back to the way that they were selecting operators, right, for, for and the selection criteria, it was based on intelligence and psychomotor abilities. So they met those two requirements and essentially it was just that it was a poor design that was confusing, it was not intuitive, and when you don't have a lot of time, you know, and you can't actually check which one activates the steering flap and which flap, uh, sorry, which control activates the landing gear, you don't have time when there's a war going on and you're actually trying to fly this airplane to check and make a mistake, right? There are no mistakes. We couldn't afford any of those. So this actually uh, was a great find. And uh, what happened was that psychologists realized that these pilot errors were actually cockpit design errors. The good news is that they could be fixed by altering the shape and the location of the controls. So um, again, this was in 1943, the war was still going, and um, once this was identified, once the problem, you know, the root cause for these errors was identified, they did make temporary fixes that were implemented during the war. So they like, I don't remember, I think they tied rubber bands on one, you know, basically they, they had a labeling system to help pilots, uh, dis, you know, to disambiguate the confusion between the similarity of the two. Um, however, after the war, all airplanes were built with these standards of shape-coded wheel and flap controls. So you'll notice that the flap control now has a square-looking shape, and the landing gear actually has a round knob. There are derivatives of this, but in, in modern-day airplanes, you'll see a square, and it'll say the word flap on it. So now you have a labeling system and a differentiating shape, and they're not next to each other anymore. So all of those things helped reduce the pilot error. In fact, probably eliminated it. So something as simple as that could be causing deadly damage. Um, but again, it was not the pilot's fault. It was just poor design. Psychoacoustics became a focal point for engineering psychologists during the war. Um, and psychoacoustics is the study of, tr of this communication between pilots. So transmitting speech intelligibly over the radio in extremely noisy conditions was problematic for pilots. Um, studies were done at various altitudes to identify improvements. In fact, um, after this research study was conducted, they suggested that pilots in, in their training that they try communicating through the radio, wearing an oxygen mask, and simulating a t the takeoff of a jet right beside them to, be, to ensure that they would actually still be heard. Um, so uh, engineering psychologists suggested peak clipping vowels and amplifying consonants, and what that means is um, this chart here on the right, I will explain in just a moment. But basically, monosyllabic words were less intelligible. So monosyllabic means that it's a word with one syllable, like bed, foot, five, right? Things like that that have just one syllable. And so I don't know if you guys know this, but um, 
in aviation, they have a particular alphabet that they use. So for example, for the letter A, they won't say A, they will say alpha. For B, which over the radio in a noisy con condition could sound like D or T or C, right? All you hear is the E at the end of it. So B is going to be Bravo. C is Charlie. D is Delta and so on and so forth. And you have the alphabet here from A to Z. And so if you notice, um, this is data coming directly from the research study, and it says phonetic alphabet and numeral errors. Um, and so basically what you're seeing here is the dashed lines beside each word indicate that no errors were made, and then the words beside it actually indicate words that were confused for the actual correct word. So um, the, the, the current aviation alphabet actually was developed through a study just like this. So that covers um, engineering psychology as well as human engineering, which is also known as human factors engineering, with relation to World War II. Now we're going to talk about how these things are applied in the real world today in terms of aviation, the military, and academia. So starting in 1953, several airplane and aviation electronic companies were hiring psychologists. However, not all of those psychologists specialized in aviation. But as we will learn shortly in, in the world of academia, several graduates from universities that had aviation laboratories were emerging, and so those were the ones that were able to find jobs in the aviation sector. Um, what was founded today as cockpit research management actually originated ex uh, back in 1953, um, and so this really focused on the designs and the layouts of a cockpit. It also focused on the seating, the galleys, the carpeting, and the restrooms. So again, they really, really focused on the ergonomics of aircraft. And if you notice, if you fly a lot, um, no matter which airline you take, no matter domestic or international, you will notice that there are specific standards of all aircraft. Um, and so this is actually the reason why. Um, in 1953, the first studies were conducted on the effects of smoking on a pilot's ability to withstand a G-force. So G-force is um, the force of gravity, right? And so given that gravity pulls us down towards the Earth, when we fly, we're actually defying gravity and pulling away from it by accelerating at a high speed. So um, basically, this was the first time that research was done on you know, physiological things and choices that pilots would be making. So smoking actually significantly affects a pilot's ability to withstand G-force. And if, you, if you've ever been on a roller coaster, that's really, really fast. That's a perfect example of G-force. Um, if it goes upside down, that's increasing the amount of G-force. So um, if that makes you feel a little bit queasy, you know, that's the same thing that happens to pilots when they fly. Um, it also pioneered measurement for transferring pilot training from simulators to actual airplanes. So they felt that it wasn't always enough to actually simulate these emergencies. So now what they've actually started to do, um, you know, post-1950s was uh, actually put pilots in training into actual aircraft and, and, you know, kill an engine or do stalls or do holes or do all of these various maneuvers that a pilot might encounter uh, in an emergency. So they do it in the simulator and then they actually do it in real life. Um, it, they also conducted experiments on the world's first air traffic control simulator. So uh, we didn't really talk about it too much in this lecture, but the job of an air traffic uh, control operator is very difficult because they're responsible for uh, observing you know, the, the traffic of airplanes, just like we have traffic on the streets and on the freeways, uh, but we can actually see that with our eyes. In, in aviation, the air traffic control in the tower is very responsible for all of these things, so it's very important to maintain, uh, you know, appropriate and correct radar of the positioning of the different aircraft so they do not crash. In terms of the military, uh, most engineers during the war, again, were not educated or trained in engineering psychology, but after the war, human factors and engineering psychology, you know, quickly gained momentum. So by 1945, uh, the Air Force Aviation Psychology Program had grown to about 200 officers, 750 enlisted men, and 500 civilians. And what's really interesting is that research that was conducted during the war was recorded in 19 publications that are known today as the Blue Books. And people still reference these Blue Books today. Um, however, the Army was not the only military sector advancing in research. The Navy also founded their own Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, D.C. in 1945. 
One of the first complex simulation studies for the Navy was called Project Cadillac. It originated due to problems with airborne combat information centers that were designed to perform surveillance functions and interception control. Essentially, that means that um, these, these combat information centers were responsible to tell the ships below when there were enemies approaching. So that was the surveillance part, and um, they were supposed to intercept those uh, enemies you know, during the war. So that actually was problematic, and it didn't seem to be working, and the Navy suffered several kamikaze attacks, and a lot of ships had sunk. So the result of this was the invention of a flying radar station, and it actually allowed for longer range detection of enemy aircraft, and so this is sort of what it looks like today. Um, many of the researchers who worked on such uh, studies moved on to actually open their own laboratories and their own schools in, in the domain of academia. Other people actually stayed and continued to do research for the Air Force or for the Navy. So. Um, Following the war, again, psychologists and human engineers continued to do research on wartime machinery. Um, some of them focused on the training systems of operators, and some of them actually founded the first laboratories of aviation in educational institutions. And among the first ones, and the most, um, the ones who had contributed the most research to this domain was the Aviation Psychology Laboratory by Alexander Williams in the University of Illinois. The Psychology Department in Aviation by Alphonse Chapanis in Johns Hopkins University, and the Laboratory of Aviation Psychology um, founded by Paul Fitz in Ohio State University. So again, this in no way you know, lists all of them. There were so many, and there still continue to be, and today in all of the universities, all of the main, you know, a, a lot of them receive support for aviation studies and aviation psychology, um, UCLA, USC, all of those. <coughs> In California still continue to sponsor this and provide programs and education in this. Um, however, these three were the ones that produced the largest share of engineering psychologists and engineering psychology research during the years of the 1940s to the 1950s. They published books, research papers, and journal articles that are still referenced today. And they actually found employment in aircraft companies such as Hughes and Lockheed. So these companies still exist today and if you remember when we were talking about the origins of human factors in the early experiments, right, we talked about Frank and Lillian Gilbreth, who worked for the General Electric Company. GE still exists today, so it's very interesting to see, you know, the advances that, that we've made in research um, across so many years, but this was actually the beginning of human factors research. So in conclusion, all of these articles and research examples were critical in identifying the fact that humans were not responsible for all errors. Granted, just like machines, humans are not perfect. However, uh, it really took off some of the stress and some of the attention from the operators who were you know, doing their best. And again, their performance was inhibited by poor design of the machines that they were interacting with. This really emphasized the importance of conducting research on pilot and operator training. Training deficiencies, right? So what, what, it, what is lacking in the particular training? How can we make training better for these operators? How can we put them in even more specific situations to prepare them better to actually operate these different machines. Um, research on perceptual motor problems, right? Um, we didn't talk about it as much here, but if you are not able to perceive your environment clearly or accurately, if your senses are affected in some way, then of course the signal will not be sent to your brain, and therefore your brain cannot send the appropriate signal to your muscles to the motor, for the motor movement to actually be executed correctly. Poorly designed instrumentation, this actually turned out to be a key factor that reduced human performance, and so research on this is very important, and more specifically, research on how to improve design became very important. Flight operation and aircraft maintenance, right? Again, to this day, we still, we still look back on these documents, and we still build airplanes uh, in relation to the particular standards of, of the research in World War II and of course air traffic control which we talked about. So we have this ongoing issue of rapid advancement, right, and it's rooted in the ever-growing complexity of systems that make machines inoperable or unfixable. So again, sometimes we are moving at too fast of a rate that we can keep up with. And so research will continue as long as technical advances are being made. So 
as long as new pieces of technology, new devices, even new updates to existing technology are continuing to be made, research will live forever because it's always important to understand how a product works, how a particular operator will be interacting with it in order for it to be successful and in order for, in order for it to actually meet the needs of the user or the operator in this case. So thanks everyone so much for watching. Again, please send your questions to csundancingprofessor at gmail.com. If you have any questions uh, in relation to aviation psychology or the early experiments or the evolution of engineering psychology, please subscribe to the channel to be notified of more videos. Thanks so much.